Okay. Getting the food out to people. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm Demel Duke Newsom, and we operate Newsom Community Farms on 56th Street North between Lewis and Highway 75. And um, one of the things that we do is um, we act as an incubator organization for people that are interested in owning their own food systems and building their own food systems in their backyard. Um, and so our um, farm uh, is a place that they can come and see how to set those little things up. Uh, we have a, a mini orchard um, and we grow um, all type of vegetables. We also have a hoop house. Um, it's, it's kind of big, um, but you know that that wouldn't be something you'd have in your backyard. But we, we can show you how to do smaller ones. Um, and then we have demonstration plots where you can come and um, and you know either you can use the plots yourself, or we can um, you know show you how we how we utilize it. We do companion planting. We have done vermicomposting, composting, which is. Um, a composting uh, with worms and um, the worm castings and things like that. Um, we collect, um, we have several partners in the community and we purposely, everything we do is mostly geared toward North Tulsa. Um, and, but that doesn't mean that we don't, we also assist um, other people that are forming community gardens and things like that. We've helped start several community gardens. We helped um, um, start the conversation to help the Corner Store initiative. Um, and we also um, have done school gardens. We had the first school garden um, in the city of Tulsa to start. So, um, and so. Was that at it, No, it was at Alcott Elementary School. Yeah. And that was one of the. Um, we work and advocate for policy changes to help uh, people of, of low-income communities to be able to access this. And so it's, it's kind of an ongoing um, kind of study to, to figure these things out because, I mean, seriously, eating healthy in a lot of ways costs a lot of money. You know, um, I know even with, with us, you know, especially if you eat mostly a meat-based diet. And so what we try to do is encourage uh, people in the community to reduce the um, amount of meat um, mm -hmm. that they eat um, as one of the ways to um, to engage in a healthier lifestyle. Um, um, our community, particularly all communities, mostly communities of color, suffer with um, diabetes and heart disease as one of the major illnesses um, and they found that most of it is related to their diet what they eat. That doesn't mean that um, they're going to switch to a diet that is culturally inappropriate for them. Um, what we try to do is work within the realms of, of who they are as a culture of people um, but allow them to make healthier food choices um, instead of eating um, um, like so much meat, if you reduce the amount of meat and you increase the vegetables, mm -hmm. uh, you can get just as full. Um, so those are some of the things that we do. Um, and part of what we do also is, uh, one of our partners is Quick Chip, and we get, um, we collect coffee grinds from them, and we have a bucket system that we, um, my husband takes in a clean bucket and exchanges it for a, a one that's filled with the coffee grinds. So we use that a lot with um, um, building our soil. So we're really into, you know, building your soil from um, from what you have your, yourself in your home. Um, and when we go through, you know, how to build a good compost, and a compost is, is a system of you building dirt, but you can't plant directly in compost. You still need um, soil um, to go in that. Um, so, um, and the elotes is another um, one of our partners. And what we do with elotes is we, um, it is a, a Mexican restaurant downtown. 
and we pick out um, all of their, their waste as well. Uh, we were doing oil um, for the use of our tractor. We were getting oil from them, their waste oil. And they mm -hmm. actually collected. What they do is we have this, um, and, and there are like no contracts involved. It's just informal conversations. And we kind of let them know what we want and what, you know, how they can help us. Um, so um, elotes, everything that they use is, um, is either, uh, it's all compo uh, compostable. You know, we don't, um, from their forks, their plates, everything that they use um, will break down and turn to dirt. You know? So that, so we, we collect uh, weekly from them. Um, my husband goes and has a big trash can, and then he just cleans their trash can out and fills um, the one up that he has on the back. And then he exchanges them out, he cleans it out, and returns the, you know, the clean one to them. And we take the, the dirty one. You know, it just depends. And we have um, gotten uh, manure from the city. Uh, we were doing that a lot, when they would, particularly when they had the horses um, we had a company that we just called up and said, um, hey, can we have the manure after your events? And they would bring out this huge truck of, you know, <laughs> all kind of manure. And, and, you know, and after the fair, too, those were some of the ones we collected the manure from that, too. Um, and um, I'm trying to think. Your honeybees, during local something. food week, we came out and looked at your honeybees okay. that you have. Yeah, we, we, we regularly have um, other organizations, schools, and like Langston University comes out every year. They, they have a training for teachers, and so the teachers come out where they're adding um, um, healthy food choices and, and um, community growing of the, of the food. Um, they come out and they they take a um, few hours tour with us every year. They've been doing it, and so um, when they came out this year, we were able to show them um, the honeybees. We were in production, and then it was at Food Week. Um, we participated in Food Week, um, and during that week this this year, we focused on the honeybees, and, um, and we had a couple of. Uh, groups of people that came out. We had uh, an early group and a latter group that was filled with children. Different, different fascination that they had. But they asked interesting questions and, you know, and it, it just kind of starts there. Um, and we also, um, I sit on several boards here, um, like in town, and they are usually uh, organizations that I feel that are really making a difference for um, low-income people. Um, and I've been asked to do other reports, but if I don't feel like their mission is, it aligns with what, what our organization is doing, and that is to empower access and teach sustainability, you know. And there are ways of, of doing that. And one of them, you know, is also respecting the culture of the people. I must say that over and over again. Whatever projects that are going on, everywhere, you need to engage the people, the indigenous people in the community, and to say, you know, like, you become a student of, of theirs. You know, I, I totally believe in that. Um, and then I sit on, um, like, three national boards and one regional board um, that deal with food, and, and they work with farmers, and, and um, and we recently have been connected with um, children that work in the field. That was one of the things we did with Whole Foods last year, was um, we looked at um, particularly the Latino children that are in the fields that are producing food for us. It was, um, it was eye opening for me, because I could kind of, you know, like, you have your focus in the food movement. And my focus, I, I never really thought about like who, other than farmers, adult farmers, that were producing the food and harvesting the food. Um, but it was, it was uh, heart, heartbreaking. Um, I went to a Kellogg's conference, 
and that's one of those big um, food conferences that you have to get invited to. It's like your name has to rise to the top of this, <laughs> you know, like mighty powers or whatever. And so anyway, I got invited to it, and one of the women um, who had been previously um, one of the children that worked in the field, as she told her story, um, I don't think it was a, a dry eye in the room where she would um, pick the onions, harvest the onions, and they have these ugly looking tube that looks like something for Freddy Krueger. <laughs> and uh, it just looked, looked awful. And, and, they, and she would go to school, and her arms and hands were like this because mm -hmm. they were so swollen. Mm -hmm. and, um, but she was determined to get an education and not go back in the field. And so um, other students, and even the teacher, would, um, she would ask them to write for her because she just, um, her goal was mm -hmm. to get out and help other children that were in the field to continue to get an education. Because these children, they travel around. I mean, school is, they, they get a little bit of school, and then they move around. And then they're working. Um, one of the movie that we showed at Whole Foods, there was a young man, he worked in the fields. And um, and he was saying that he was, he was doing tomatoes, I believe. But his skin started falling off. It was like, awful because this, the field had been sprayed heavily mm -hmm. with pesticides. Mm -hmm. And so these are some of the things that these children are dealing with. Um, and, and it's like, um, I don't want to just cry for the children. I want, I want to be a voice that says, you know, let's stop, you know. And I think ways of stopping is that we, we recognize that these injustices are going on. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I've skipped all of the food production, but these are people that produce and harvest our food, and they and they start at four years old. Mm -hmm. You know, this is. I mean, I'm just thinking, what kind of child labor laws affect them? Mm -hmm. You know, I write it on. I want the immigrant people to go away. Well, you're gonna get them in the field. So it's got to be made safer. And it's got to be where the children are coming out the fields. And recently, on NPR, there's a big wave of women that are being raped constantly in these fields. You know, so what? You know, like is this some kind of social madness that I don't know? We've got to stop. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about production of food, I mean it's a big gamut of things that are involved. You know. And we need to say no to places that are using child labor mm -hmm. in the field. Yeah. And we need to not be ignorant and hide in the sand, you know. Because they, everything that we want for our children, they want for their children as well, you know, to have the education. And these are American children. These children were born here. But they, but because of, of who they are and the culture that they come from, this is what they're doing. Um, I don't know if you all are familiar with the Mockley workers, you know, down in Florida. I mean, they were producing food for um, Trader Joe's. That was one of the big companies. Um, um, and it was over tomatoes. They would, um, they couldn't, like, they, they could be in the field, they would be in, in the fields for hours, hours at a time. You know, really hot in Florida, but they mm -hmm. couldn't eat any of the food if they, you know, like ate anything. And they, would, I mean, it's it's really like another form of slavery. They mm -hmm. they're hurt, they're um, abused in these fields, and then they were paying them like paying like oh, two dollars an hour. It was really really low, um, and then randomly they would gather them all up and send them back to Mexico. You know, because they would want to comply with the laws, but of course they bring them back to work. So it's a back and forth thing. But these these people, there have been marches, and if you get a chance, I look up and hear that story about these workers down there, and the and all of the atrocities that they're suffering. You know, trying to produce food for us greedy Americans. 
<laughs> There's a great book on it called Tomato Land that, that chronicles. It's it's a great book that talks about just yeah how the simple fruit and you look at it and all the chaos yeah. that it went into the production. It's so much, and that's mm. I think that I know for farmers markets when tomatoes come out, I mean people will pay anything for tomatoes. I think my kids one summer I let them I went in the house and they sold three tomatoes I think for. It was seven dollars, and they were little to me. And it's people, and they haggled, and you know, it's like two people were haggling over, you know, you know, my kids were like seven dollars. <laughs> Take that. So, anyway. well, thank you. Thank you. That's we 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 hear the passion, which is great. So I leave. Um. Well, I work with Food Bank, and the Community Food Bank of Eastern Oklahoma serves 24 counties uh, in the eastern part of the state. And one thing that really resonated that you said that I think really carries over is that when you talk about it's critical if you're really going to be any assistance of people to serve within their culture. And so the Food Bank is kind of a state's rights model in that way. So we have agreements, like if we you can't sell the food to get it, from the, you know, because we have agreements with donors that we're not going to compete with them and sell the food, whatever. But Aside from those basic food safety and a few agreements, then you can serve the community in which you reside in the model that best serves the cultures of the people, um, really your own capacity. Uh, and we have gently tried to persuade our partners to move to something called the choice model, um, which means instead of going and saying, oh, you need food, okay, well, here's these two bags and this, you know, take these and this will be good for you, to try to set it up where you know, people are able to self-select um, from almost a buffet style, depending on the geography. Design really does impact how our partners are able to serve. It really affects capacity. 99.9% .9 of the places that are serving the hungry today were not designed to serve the hungry. Their churches, their old YMCA's, I mean, they were not designed to be a food distribution center. So people have a widely varying capacity. Um, some of them have refrigeration, some of them don't, and that, of course, dictates what kind of product they can take and distribute. So we really, um, it's, it's beautiful and challenging to try to work with so many different models because everybody is pretty sure that their model is kind of the only model. And we have 450 partner programs with so 450 only models. Um, so it's, but, but I get it because you, you know, you're looking in the face of somebody who's hungry and they need help and you want to give them the best products you can and that may be different. Um, so we, 17.2 million pounds of food went through the food bank last year. Um, I think Oklahoma is ranked as the lowest consuming state across all income guidelines for fresh fruits and vegetables. So we have made a deliberate effort to uh, make that a priority. So about a quarter of the 17.2 million pounds were uh, pounds of fresh produce. Um, I told Demelda um, we have some partners that love that. And we have, I had one woman call and said, you're killing me with your fresh produce. And I got to have canned green beans. I don't have the capacity. I don't, you know, I, I don't know who's going to come to get the cabbage. And so, uh, you know, we, we walk that line. We try to make sure that we are serving all levels of capacity. Um, Oklahoma is, I think, one in every six Oklahomans is classified as being food insecure. That doesn't mean that they will necessarily go hungry, but that means that they do not know for sure if they're going to get the next meal or where it's going to come from, and that number rises to one in four when you're talking about children. So um, the food bank, the vast majority of the food we distribute is through our partner programs. We have a few other smaller programs that are direct distribution. We have a program designed for low-income seniors. Um, that is a mix of shelf-stable goods, fresh produce, and bakery items. That has been enlightening. Um, I cannot tell you how many very cute seniors will look at the bread, because it's usually bread that's been donated by Walmart or Target, and it is usually their artisan bread, so it's not sliced, it's, you know, uh, and they'll say, oh, my doctor doesn't want me to have bread, but I will take that pie. Uh, like, well, let's think of your doctor. I think I need uh, So it is a constant, you know, we need to meet people where they are. The first senior servings, we took mangoes, plums, onions, sweet potatoes, and okra, and guess what went home with this? 100%. I don't think we gave away one mango. So we learned, because this is culture. a population. It culture. Is. Yeah. It is. And, um, and this, it's a population that does not want to waste. They're not yeah. going to take it if they're not going to use it. So we learned that we have to be like Sam's. If we have something that isn't 
familiar that we need to have samples and we need to have recipe cards. Right. So you know, it's it's an evolution. Yeah. Um, we're still not giving away a lot of mangoes, but we're not taking all of them mm -hmm, back. So mm -hmm. it just varies, and we're learning that way. We do have. Um, a culinary program at the food banks that which has reduced our waste because you know tomatoes are a great example um, for some reason people who have too many tomatoes like to call us Friday at four o'clock and we don't have distribution on the weekends and we don't want to take overripe tomatoes you know but we do because now we have staff and volunteers that can come in and make spaghetti sauce or sauce on Saturday oh. uh, it's not going to go out in its natural form but we can do something so it's reduced the waste to about three percent um, which is, you know, given the level of fresh produce, that's something that I, I would like it to be zero, but I don't know that it ever will be. Uh, we do have some uh, partnerships in the community with Morton and Community Health Connections where we are trying to address some of the issues that you discussed. Um, we have cooking classes for newly diagnosed diabetics that are team taught by a nutritionist and a chef. Same thing for hypertension. Um, and, you know, it's sometimes we have a full house and sometimes we have two people. And it's just, you know, if the two people that come walk away with something good, it's, it's, I think it's been a successful endeavor. So that's something that, um, you know, with a board of directors, I have to discuss, you know, we did a great job with two people or we put out 15 million pounds of scent. And I don't know that they're either or, but sometimes you have to make a really good case for the two people argument. And so that's something, um, we do something called Cooking Matters, which again is team taught by chef and nutritionist. It's a series of six classes. It's a huge time commitment for somebody um, who's struggling with poverty. It's two hours, six sessions of two hours. Um, so for the people that can commit to that, it's great, but that's tough. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's a tough commitment. So that's another one, like if we partner with someplace, we do like Educare sites where there's some place to watch the kids. We've done oh. um, parents of preschoolers, we've done grand parents raising grandchildren, and they can come together. So if we can come up with um, targets that, uh, are inclusive or have childcare, we have much better numbers. Mm -hmm. um, the curriculum was designed by ConAgra and Walmart, so they've done a lot of research on it. Then the outcomes for the people that can stick are great, but it's just a really tough thinking. I mean, I don't, I was not in poverty, but when I had two kids under two, there's no way I'm going to a cooking club. So, you know, we know that it's not perfect. Um, we're piggybacking right off of uh, the grocery, the mobile grocery we have. Um, a food truck that we, uh, I think, was supposed to be delivered today, but it was also supposed to be delivered every day last week. So I don't know if it's really there or not. Um, but it, it, the same thing. You know, there are places in town that um, access is just a problem. I mean, they have great partner programs, but the partner programs only have volunteers to be open two hours on a Tuesday and two hours on a Thursday, and what happens in between. And so the truck is designed. It was initially um, designed to be able to alleviate the drought in school meals when school's not in session. And that'll be its number one priority. But of course, there's a lot of time that school is in session. And we'll be using it um, you know, for some of the homeless veterans groups and seniors. Kind of plugging in, there's a little partner program that um, has long lines. They're open two um, Thursday nights a week, and they have hour and a half long lines, mainly elderly folks. And so we'll serve a meal while they're waiting to go get you know, food for the next couple of weeks. So and we are trying to be innovative. Um, in distribution, but um, sometimes it's really like a real-time working grocery warehouse. You know, I have trucks, and if they're not there on time, I get the call. Your truck's late, and you know I'm giving my bananas to John 360. Okay, <laughs> if they're still feeding hungry people, it's okay. But um, so it's kind of a hybrid model. Um, you have to kind of keep that working warehouse going and still be mindful of the end user. So that's what. Great, Scott. Okay, I'm here today to talk about the RG Family Grocers, which is uh, the business model that we're putting out for a uh, healthy community store initiative, which is our nonprofit. Uh, this kind of came about from my work in the grocery industry in uh, near near downtown in West Tulsa, and just seeing a lot about food insecurity and really noticing where that gets home in Tulsa, that there are just areas that have no access to supermarkets, uh, whether that's from public transportation issues or locality. Um, so we started out a long time ago, and Tanelda was on board with this, we were working to find a way to create a distribution model wherein several uh, partners could collectively purchase and access the, uh, the retailer uh, warehouses, which 
minimum purchase orders are approximately twenty thousand dollars a week, which is quite a bite to take for any store unless you're uh, a Reese's or a Walmart or something like that. We were not having much luck in finding people willing to work together. It seems to me that the convenience stores are largely very competitive and are very afraid of perishable foods. Despite having a curriculum uh, developed, uh, I think by the University of Washington to convert convenience stores into healthy corner store models, we just didn't have much success. So we kind of looked at a different way of approaching this. The idea is to get more healthy stores into limited supermarket access communities. And the idea that we came up with is taking a baby step of bringing the grocery store into the community. So we uh, it's kind of came about for us while attending the Rural Grocers Initiative that's sponsored by uh, this is pretty good. It's up at K-State. It's the Center for Engagement and Community Development. They do this every two years. And while I was uh, up there the last time, I was visiting with an agricultural economist, and she had created a model of uh, distribution uh, for serving communities that were at least 60 miles apart and working to get grocery stores supplied at that lower wholesale pricing. So we took her numbers and kind of looked at what we could do in Tulsa, and it kind of panned out. So my partner in this project, Katie Quohan, was visiting with uh, the health department and was speaking in front of the board of directors, and Rick Helmer was in the audience, and said, I really like this project. Why don't you put something together? So we went in, and they agreed to fund the development of the, the trailer and truck so that we could get this thing going. And then, uh, that was followed up with a pledge by the uh, George Kaiser Family Foundation to purchase our initial inventory. And the food bank uh, generously agreed to host our uh, distribution center, which at this point is a 20-foot cargo container placed inside their uh, gated yard. Uh, as we speak, the electric pole is being hooked up to it. We'll also be able to plug the trailer in over here. So the trailer gets plugged in on the truck to a generator that has to run full time when we're out in the field to keep the refrigeration going. So what we did is took a nine horse trailer, which is approximately 35 feet long, and sealed up all the horse windows and took out the stalls and cleaned it up and installed some refrigeration and some shelving and put in a point of sale system based on an iPad. That's very mobile. We can pick up a signal just about anywhere in Tulsa and keep it functioning. And Scott, just can we ask questions oh, the end of the event? Just curious of why you chose the, the trailer as opposed to you know how like <coughs> the, the bookmobile, the library has the that sort of setup uh -huh. all self-contained. Was it just the well? It really comes down to if you uh, have a food truck that's one unit, if anything mechanical happens, you're out of operation until it's repaired. But if you have a trailer, then all you have to do is find another tow to keep yourself in operation. So in order to minimize the amount of time it's possible to pick up a truck, that trailer is the best option. So uh, through our research, we went out and visited uh, Students at Vanderbilt University in Nashville put together their model um, Nashville Mobile Market, which they have, to a certain extent, franchised. <coughs> There's one in operation in Chattanooga and one in Memphis as well. I had heard that students, some students at uh, University of Oklahoma, were going to be taking their curriculum and adopting something for use in Oklahoma City, but I haven't seen any materialization of that. The other model that we looked at is out in New Mexico base in Albuquerque and it goes out to the, uh, the Pueblos, which are very remote rural districts, and brings, they've got actually you know, a tractor trailer with slide out refrigeration, it's, it's the granddaddy of them all. So we were, went out to see what are people buying, what are people looking for, and taking their lack of, lack of successes and bringing them back, looking for opportunities in 
power source in excess. So what we've done with that is created some companion programs. Uh, we're teaming up with the health department and OSU Ag Extension Office to do some health screenings and do some educational components. So the idea is to bring a ride-along companion with us to set up at each stop. Uh, currently we have six stops in North Tulsa, six stops in West Tulsa, at each stop twice a week, uh, Monday through Saturday. So it's 24 stops a week. In addition, we uh, have partnered up with NCOG's uh, Agency on Area Aging and uh, looking at a couple of senior centers to go into. So throughout these partnerships, we have gone out in the community and created some questionnaires for asking people, uh, where are you located? Where do you need a store? What times? What are you looking for? And what we've found and made our site selection based on is rooftops, access to transportation, and commercially viable retail center where the stop is located. Our goal then is after a year or two of operation to help someone from the community take our sales data and back their own store into the retail center where the stops are located. What we'd really like to do is put ourselves on the business and create more of an economic incubator within these communities so that if there's a community store there, you can have a larger variety and act as a traffic generator for that retail center. Perhaps more uh, local entrepreneurs can start businesses and improve services and retail opportunities in these low income areas. Our, our uh, 20 foot cargo container is co located over at Community Food Bank. Uh, that's where we're going to be storing all of our deliveries. Once we get into the growing season, we have several partnerships with area farmers. What we would like to do is be able to bring their produce in and open up the distribution to areas, um, restaurants, elote for example, um, institutions, and try and help bridge the gap between the farmers who are growing and the consumers. A lot of times there's a big disconnect with the farmers being able to leave <coughs> their growing operation and deliver to a restaurant or an institution. And conversely, it's difficult for a restaurateur to leave the restaurant and go out to the farm. We see that there's a really big piece missing for the middleman, if you will. Uh, the farmer's market model works pretty well for those farmers who are able to get off the farm and come in. But we really see that in order to improve the, uh, the growing capacity, farmers that there needs to be a broader distribution aspect. The further step that we'd like to take with this is to create an incubator kitchen. Eileen mentioned that they've gotten their produce waste down to 3%, which is pretty phenomenal, yeah. by reprocessing the food. We're looking for opportunities to have a commercial kitchen available for startup entrepreneurs. If you wanted to become a restaurateur, you'd probably end up investing about $100,000 just in your kitchen alone to start a restaurant. So we believe that if we have a facility that can commonly be used by potential food entrepreneurs to come in and have that certified kitchen and perhaps get some uh, educational training about running a business, um, working with the health department, getting your product out to the marketplace that this could be a further like, uh, boost to low income area. That's not right. Great. I want to ask Scott a question. You said you all were initially funded by Hammer and Kaiser. Mm -hmm. So after that funding is depleted, is there a, a way? Because one of the things is, is unlike the communities that you're serving, How's it, I mean, do you have uh, funding to go beyond this first few years or? Well, the funding we've received is really startup funding. And, right. and my belief is that this is 
the, the front part of a new wave of um, philanthropy. That we're really going to be looking, rather than people coming back to the well every year to continue operations, that we're going to be looking at more developing sustainable models that are able to support themselves and reach out and grow into other opportunities to help people. So what methods of payment do you currently accept? And I have, you sell the groceries at a competitive price, I assume. Yes. And so, I mean, do you take food stamps, stamp? Cash, food stamps, and uh, credit debit cards. So we've approached the WIC situation mm -hmm. and had discussions with uh, EHS administrators in Oklahoma City, I believe. Unfortunately, because our model is a little bit unusual, mm -hmm. we've been lumped into a category where we would have to have something like 40 different cereal brands on the shelf. And it was, it was pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. So as we as we develop our inventory and our stop system, they're quite willing to work with us through the, the federal office and, and create a new model. Well, Scott, do you know the, the um, Native Amer American organizations, like we did um, Osage Quick, and it, it seemed like it would work with your model because um, it's just a, right, not at all. And uh, the Cherokee Wick, I know it's a little different, but the Osage one is a really good one. We, we, most of our uh, clientele were Osage Wick recipients and not State Wick recipients. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, it, it opened up, you know, um, uh, a lot more um, customers. And there's no requirement for travel membership whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Really easy. Uh, residency in Osage County or anything like that? Mm -hmm. If you can, that's all. We'll have that conversation. Okay. Right. Right. Fine. <laughs> There was a question. Yeah, I just basically want to know what that's all about on the Osage and the Cherokee with model being different from other, you know, programs. From What's the, the difference? All right, from the state wig. Yeah, so, so I guess you can talk about that. I can't. I can't talk with as far as differences in the tribal organizations from ours because, from my understanding, any establishment that's going to accept wig vouchers has to carry a certain percentage of the foods that that are offered and such. So. I wouldn't be able to speak to as to why it would be easier. Well, we just did the the, um, the vegetable program during the summer. But we, you know, um, like I said, we had a flood of, of um, clients from most of the group. And they have the same program as well. And the qualifications and the stipulations are different than what the state does. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't have to be Osage in order to. Um, to get the weight from the O7. Just one more 